All right, we're live. I'm here today with my brother, Maquandan Garado, and hey. he's a multifaceted disc jockey, music man extraordinaire, but he's also a man who, at one point in his life, is how we ended up meeting, decided he wanted to take a nine-week course in mm -hmm. Amharic. <laughs> so we got a, a lot of different things we could talk about, man, but how, how is it, uh, how's it going? Kind of off camera a little bit, we got into it, but I think it would be beautiful for everybody to hear a as an artist, kind of uh, being forced to be indoors. How's that like dichotomy between getting more time to reflect and, and focus on your craft versus, you know, wanting to still see people, which is where your craft ultimately is. It's like no, eyes to face. Agreed. That's a great question. And first, just let me say thank you for, for bringing me to, to your platform because I appreciate what you're doing. I think we need to have uh, more engagement and more dialogue with each other. So I, I salute you and your effort. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I would say that, that this whole process for me is, has been kind of rewarding in, a, in an indirect sort of way, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously everything is shut down and there isn't much that we can do except for kind of identifying the silver lining and everything and, and buckling down and, and, and tapping into your creative power. So as I said before we started recording, I've actually liked that part of it. You know, being able to, to buckle down, do more reading, explore new yeah. music, uh, record mixes and things like that, put lists together and, and also tap into other other areas that I'm interested in, um, mainly production. So I've enjoyed the, the time. And at the same time, I also respect what, what it means for the general mass body of, of people course. on the planet. Yeah, and the harm. Uh, you're saying like you're not trying to put anybody's harm like down they're not trying to like, right not at all because yeah. I, I recognize that first and foremost you know and and i hold space for that because it's tough it's even been tough for me as an entrepreneur um you know we were supposed to start something in september that's been pushed back to perhaps next march so you know everyone i think is being impacted in their own right and i respect everybody's space and, and yet for me it's just kind of going inward you know, and, and making sure that, that I really check in with myself on a much more frequent basis, like my meditations are for longer periods of time because I've got more time on my hands, yeah. you know, right? So, you know, just kind of being being hopeful and, 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 and really seeing what's what's most important and, and really staying connected and tapped in. That That's beautiful, man. You put that very well. Like, I feel you exactly on the reading and then the other stuff, you know, I could tan like tangentially relate like the reading. Mm -hmm. I had uh, put church stuff at the forefront for so long. I had like forgotten or neglected about Ethiopian history. And then I went back to my parents crib. My Ooh. dad has like a thousand different books you could imagine. And then I had a few of my own lying around that I hadn't touched. And this is the first time in a long time, like, I don't know about you, but you know, being Los Angelinos, I spend a lot of time on the road, like yep. where I work from where I normally Straight live. Up. Stay at versus, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like different activities. I do jujitsu. It's like 14, 15 miles away. So 30, if you, if you count, you know, both ways in traffic, mm -hmm. it's no bueno. So like the biggest cut for me is road time, you know? So yeah. And, and, and like, making use of that time, right? Whether it's like, you know, I was never a big podcast person. I've been more into audio books, but uh -huh. whatever it is that, that, you know, suits your interest, I think it's, it's all about utilizing that time properly. I used to have crazy commutes, you know, to and from work. So the idea of, of being stuck in my car, you know, ironically, I don't listen to a lot of music in my car. I'm uh -huh. more tapped into presentations or lectures and things like that um so i hear you completely you know that's there, interesting there's though, be because you're trying to, to you're trying to make a different space there is that because you're trying to separate pretty much you know i, I mean i, I feel yeah. like when, when i was so when i had my sort of nine to five gig i spent a lot of my days in meetings mm -hmm. and i i hardly <laughs> actually <laughs> ever had a chance to do the work that i was supposed to do because i was always in meetings and so uh -huh. i i realized that that just making use of my personal time was was critical whether it was something spiritual or an audio book some sort of self-personal development entrepreneurial related stuff history whatever it was i needed to keep my brain active because i knew as soon as i got into the office i would have people at my door 
ready to discuss something from the previous day and you know it's just <laughs> it's hectic and chaotic so oh absolutely it's become like mimetic man it's a meme that, <laughs> yeah <laughs> that you know is this That's is this something point. you could have said in an email you know is this something you said you could have said in Come an on. email Come or on. did we really need a meeting of this in the church context a number of years ago i once yeah. uh, told people the number one instrument of the devil are church committees <laughs> it's like, oh, you want people to not goodness. get stuff done you get a yeah. committee about making a committee a task force for this <laughs> Do you, um, <laughs> are you familiar with uh, this guy named Reverend Ike? He was a, no, I'm not familiar. A, a, Tell he me was about a, a, a pastor, a preacher in New York. Uh huh. And he basically like applied an esoteric understanding to theology, essentially. And so he would, he, I was listening to a presentation of his that a friend of mine sent me um, a couple of days ago. And he talked, he made that same point. He was like, if, if you ever had an opportunity to have an idea shot down, give it to a committee full of people <laughs> and watch them do their work over a period of time. So it's funny that you mentioned that. You said the exact same thing. Oh, it's a big thing I learned in my life. There are some things I have I say or do mm -hmm. where uh, people will, especially in the Ethiopian community, talk about how intransigent and iron-willed and inflexible I am. And what I realized in a lot of time of self-reflection, like you were talking about earlier, is if anything, that was me actually being compromising. And so it was a point about two yeah. or three years ago, I said, oh, y'all thought I was in transit? You thought I wasn't budget? Right. Like you're right. about to see that turned up about three times. Times now, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's funny because I, that doesn't like, I, I never thought of you in that light personally. So it's yeah. interesting that that's the feedback, but that <laughs> I, I think that, you know, I, I try to give everybody credit and I try to give myself credit and, 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 and give myself a break too. We all are where we are. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day, no matter what it is that you're trying to do, whether it's some business pursuit that I also would consider being creative outside yes. of the conventional sort of creative sense, mm -hmm. everyone is where they are and, and hopefully people value the idea of collaboration. You know, particularly with our people and, and everything 100%. historically that is taking place and even things that are occurring, you know, modern day. The um, thing I studied the most was dispute resolution. In that's law right. That was your, that's right. That that's was right. my shit. I've, I've been you teaching. Left, you went out of state, right? Yeah, I went to North. Time. I went to the legendary North Dakota. Uh, I came yeah, back. I, <laughs> I went to uh, Central Cali, uh, Merced and Turlock, where a lot mm. of the farming you know, gets done, but where yeah. itself is a food desert because they're sending their food away. So, you know, you That's see different right. things. It's a different side of California. Yeah, when you that, go in there. many ways, like Ethiopia kind of has that issue too, which is weird. You, you have yeah. the propensity to feed people, yet it becomes more business related for folks to export whatever it is they can export. Yeah, people it's hustling us using, using IP, so-called IP. To, to hustle off the year, gotcha, coffee. And <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> I just, you know, that if, the, if I could count, if I had a nickel for every time somebody was like, oh, yeah, you know, like I got this Ethiopian coffee, and I'm just like, am, am I supposed to be impressed by this? Or, yeah, thanks. <laughs> it's <the> Ethiopian owned, <laughs> is the question. Uh, yeah, saying. that is, the, that is uh, the supreme question. And I hope that, that our people understand that. Yeah, I had I have uh, one friend, uh, Rebka. We were linking up after a number of years at one of these Habasha networking events, and mm. she said uh, with her her pops out in Orange County, they have like a, a food truck that's a coffee truck that, oh, really? that they're doing. So that's, that's cool. one Ethiopian. I don't live in the OC, so it's you know I don't yeah. necessarily pull up on them like that. But I've I've yeah, seen them do that. I grew up yeah. out there, but. But yeah, yeah, more LA now. So that's yeah. that's a good segue, like the entrepreneurship as as art. I 100% agree with you. It's a topic I actually think about a lot, and I didn't think about it directly in in thinking about you know how I was gonna like chop it up with you. But that's yeah. a really good point. I didn't I didn't know you had gone. It sounds like you're saying you've gone the full entrepreneurship route, where at one point you had a nine to five plus the side hustle. Can you yeah, walk basically. us through like all all that? Because sure, those, those yeah. are some decisions I've gone through, and I know a, a lot of other people have gone through that too. I mean the 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 short, the short response to that question is that I would encourage everybody to do it and, and be completely open to it. Like I've stepped away from nine to five jobs to, to basically launch and have failed like numerous times on business Same. opportunities. But I'm, I'm glad that I took the risk because 
I learned a great deal about myself and what it would take to kind of elevate to that next level. And the truth is, like, like I always felt like I could always get a job. I felt like my network mm -hmm. was was strong enough where I could always tap in. My background is in education. I studied political science in college, and then I got a master's Same. degree in public administration. And so my initial interest was actually electoral politics. Yeah. So believe it or not, like back I in did not know that. That's so Back funny. in 2005, 2006, my like I had a core group of friends where we were trying to run for a city council seat here in Southern California. And uh -huh. we had run the numbers and done the data. I even talked to my dad about it. And then he talked to like my other cousin. They were like, what, what kind of money do you need to raise? Mm -hmm. We'll get Ethiopians to uh, raise money. And then sooner or later, like I, I basically realized that electoral politics just wasn't for me. Because my interest was, how do I go and get resources and bring it back to my people? Mm -hmm. And I realized that that was going to be done through entrepreneurship, that, that oh the electoral God. process is, is murky. Um, you know, I God bless everybody that, that chooses to jump in it. I know some great people who are elected officials right now who are doing some really cool work, but I just don't have the patience. Same, for, and I keep I keep tabs stuff. on them a little bit later you than have, you. Yo, for real. <laughs> I went to for the real. belly of the beast. I worked for mm. uh, Congressman Dennis Kucinich. If you remember him, he ran I in two thousand eight. Yeah. Uh, he's Ohio a Democrat. Uh, he was originally the the only Democrat who was saying no to the Obama health care system from yep. a progressive point of view, from That's the point right. of view that it didn't go far enough, that it needs to be single payer. Mm -hmm. Obama takes him on Air Force One. Nobody knows what he said to him on that flight, but when he yeah. came back, he came and he co-signed. <laughs> I remember that because he did the, are you familiar with uh, Democracy Now? The yeah, oh, I love program? That. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, That's one so, of my go-tos. Yeah, for sure. I, I would encourage anybody who watches this, like if you want, some straight up daily news, that's the place to go. Um, and so they actually had him. I remember he did an interview with Amy Goodman yep. right after his sort of pivot. And, uh -huh. and I could tell how uncomfortable that was for him. And, and I think even there was a presence of, of slight shock, like in, even in how they were, she was engaging with them because they, they obviously have had a, a long relationship. He was the one actually who put me on to the US Postal Service being sort of defunded mm -hmm. in the name of privatizing it. You know, this concept that the US Postal Service is just, it's not as efficient as like your, your private industry counterparts like a UPS or a FedEx. And he was saying, no, 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 hold on. This is one of the greatest inventions in this country. And the idea that we wanna privatize it is really rooted in us not funding it properly. And sort of giving it a, a negative um, stigma. Yeah, it was. So that, I, I, I respected that guy a lot in terms of because that's not easy to to do for to be in Congress for two years. Y your your time is very short, so you spend most of your time fundraising. As oh, a yeah. result, you know, and he's he's made points about that too. So it's very very difficult to sort of to root down and and do some incredible work. Oh yeah, he he did he did. When I was with him, is when I gathered some of the um, co-signed letters that originally got rid of DACA. You know, which is oh, like, okay, you know what I'm saying, like Bush era, yeah. Clinton era stuff. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> oh Lord, <laughs> like like you, that. You that have one, a whole show just on that. That's crazy. And he was always against the war, and he was always about you mm -hmm. know. Uh, the prison reform and the drug war ending stuff way before a lot of other cats were hip to it, which is what drew me to him. I, right. I, I definitely am not going to sound disparaging. I had such a great time with him. I'll tell you, there was another funny moment where it was really a healthcare and then the corn stuff. That's the only right. times that he folded on corn and on uh, healthcare. I remember yeah. I asked the, one of the top people one time and he was like, you can't fight corn, bro. <laughs> That's like you can't big, fight the corn lobby. Like I mean, <laughs> you know, look what happened with Oprah when she was talking about she was going to stop eating beef. They went after her tough. What happened to her? What, what it's like her? she had she you know when she's obviously her show was incredibly popular with uh, women in this country, particularly mm -hmm. mothers. Um, and they had a show where they were talking about the the, the health benefits of avoiding meat, and then she got uh -huh. taken to court like soon after. You can wow. look it up. It's really interesting. You know, they're powerful interests. And, and I would love to see that. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, time is, time tells. 
stories. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, so you made that transition. You said, I'm going to try this out, you know, little failure, big success, whatever happens. Yeah, multiple I'm times. Try it. So yeah. like, like, don't get it twisted. Like I, I, so I was like, you know what? This nine to five gig isn't for me. Like I'm, I'm not as effective as I could be if I branched out on my own. And I thought, okay, let me go and get resources. I, I was already DJing and, and making cool money off of that. And that could supplant, you know, a, a little bit of what I would be losing in terms of an income. But yeah, it's also, you got to step out. And I feel like sometimes if you just take the first step, the path will then kind of clear itself. I think a lot of people sort of sit on their fear because they haven't figured out every step along the way. And I, and I learned, I used to be like that. I figured out with the help of some friends who were like, listen, just take a first step and then see what happens. And then things sort of conspire and, and work in your favor. And then, you know, when, when things didn't work out for me that first initial time, which was 2015 or 2016, Mm -hmm. I ended up getting pulled in. I, re I reached out to a friend who was also an entrepreneur, but was yep. working a nine to five. And he was like, actually, my office needs some help. So it's funny that you that you reached out. And I just reached out to say hi. I wasn't looking for a job yeah. or anything. Like we were just, I was just trying organic. to reconnect. You know, yeah, for sure. Like it always is and should be. You know, you don't ever have to force anything. And then that led to an opportunity working at, another university mm -hmm. and and that gave me the freedom to literally work from my house oh and my research God. other opportunities to which eventually led to another gig that then led to an opportunity to cultivate something for myself so it just i just went from i was at long beach state I, yep. I went, you I put me on to that radio channel. I don't know if you remember this 88.1 oh, uh, right yeah yeah the k-jazz station so that was a really, i drove for two years as a Lyft driver in between a lot of the different things I was doing to, to uh, give myself self-time reflect. Word. And that's a station I used to always play. And that's because of Makonan Garado. Oh, you might not even sure. know you affected sure. me like that. No, bro. That's, that's dope. <laughs> it's a really good, you know, they've had management issues for a really long time, but I'm such a jazz head that like I, I tuned into specific shows on that station mm -hmm. and, and they were really valuable. I haven't been tapped into it much. Um, yeah, one I of switched the guys, between them and KUSC. Oh, okay. KUSC. Yeah. The classical, classical music. Station? So yeah, classical yeah. and then like jazz. That's clutch, bro. So I used to wake up to KUSC. That was my alarm. <laughs> my, That's dope. My That's a dope alarm. Wake up. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Dude, classical music. People underestimate classical music. Like that. That's that's the way to go. But so getting back to my transition, I was at Long Beach State. I was working in the outreach office and and basically doing a sort of out of state recruitment where I was traveling a lot. I was hardly mm -hmm. in the office and it was the coolest gig because I saved a bunch of money. And, and you know, I got to see different parts of the country that I normally would not have been able to see. And then from that, I transitioned to UCLA and I, I had a contract for a year and chose not to renew it to pursue something on my own. So Beautiful. that was a point where I was like, you know what, this is cool and comfy, but I need to bounce and, and do something different. Yeah, and then, there are like, a lot of Habashas who work there, by the way. I'm sure you ran a into them. Ton. I, <laughs> I and I run into people like <laughs> my know pops Naomi? probably in Westwood. Do you know Naomi? Naomi? She was a student at so. the time. She's like she's actually like a distant cousin of mine. No, um, I don't know her. She was grad. I think she was graduating around the time I was there. Just a lot of there were a lot of folks for sure. Yep. And and UCLA has they have. If you go to their library, they've got a lot of books on Ethiopia. They got Goethe's manuscripts. Uh, our, our local priest worked on Goethe's manuscripts there. Really? Like he, he, yeah, yeah. He helped edit them. That's interesting. So, because part of me is like, why do you have all this stuff? And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's always you know, it's tricky. That's, that's like the dual thing. There's this cat I follow on uh, Twitter. He's a Babylonian expert, and mm. um. He does like cuneiform and all these ancient languages, a few of these ancient Semitic languages. And right. he has this thing where he's going to critique the museums for how they stole this stuff, yeah. but he's not going to stop appreciating the beauty of the stuff that's there. 
Yeah, and, that's and a I hard think that's, that is critical. And I think that's such a great point to make um, for people who watch this because we really have to understand colonialism and its impact on us and how people looted important things that belong to us. And it's weird how they make their way to these institutions and you know, no one has sort of a clear answer as to how they got there, but yeah, it's Italy is uh, giving us back some obelisks, uh, but somewhere supposedly as friendly as the crown of, of England, which had long relationships with the crown of Ethiopia, mm -hmm. still has the the body. I don't know what shape it's in, but the, the coffin at least and the, the remains, let me say, of mm -hmm. Prince Alamayo, the son of Emperor <laughs> Teodoro. They still yeah. have that. I don't I don't yeah. know if you know uh, Salam. I think she's a mutual friend. Salam X, she she did a little movie on on him too. Uh, really? And, uh, yeah, yeah. And if you know Maaza Mangustu, who did the Shadow King book recently, um, she I she wrote an article. Twitter. Yeah, she wrote an article okay. to them. Give us back the remains. You know, yeah, they, they're silent. That, that's a pretty sick history. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's undeniable. Like at this point, like you know, I, I think that there's some serious conversations need to be had about that. In, in rectifying what what occurred. Um, yeah, it's it's bizarre. Like, it's almost just like, do you think if you ignore it, it mm -hmm. didn't happen? Right, right. And I think that with a lot of what has occurred in the past that seems to be uh, the easiest path, the sort of path of least resistance for people who don't want to deal with that truth, you know? But so I, you know, back to UCLA, I, I left, jumped and leaped and, and figured my way out during that time. And then I was like, all right, well, this isn't working. I don't know how to make this work. I need more income. I ended up getting another gig that allowed me to work from home with UC Davis. And I'm very thankful for nice. that, that opportunity because I had the most freedom I've ever had in this sort of conventional nine to five work sense. Um, you know, I, I did what I had to do in the morning and then the rest of the day I sort of committed to myself oh my and then God. that led me back to Long Beach to take another position on campus and then that provided an opportunity to get into what we're doing now. So, you know, I, I think that we've been conditioned. I know that I had to look in the mirror and really call out my own conditioning mm -hmm. and a lot of it stems from what my parents dealt with in their transition to the United States. Yeah. And I think we as Ethiopians, particularly as like first generation folks who were born here, as you get older, you start to develop deeper understandings of your parents. And at the end of the day, my parents sought stability and security 100%. because of what they dealt with. And so they might have not been maybe conventional risk takers, but they, they took the biggest risk in leaving home, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I credit yeah, that, them for that. That's funny, that's, that's, the, right. You, that's what right. is the, what's that a bigger the risk, risk than that, yeah. you know? And so even though they were sort of working conventional jobs and, and my father was really big on, you know, make sure you get a stable situation, that I had to work on that conditioning and really be open to taking leaps. You know, my yeah. car broke down and my money was tight. So like, instead of renting a car, I, you know, did the lift thing for about a month and a half uh -huh. and did their rental program. And then that provided me a car That's until right. my, my car was fully repaired. So, you know, you figure it, you figure your way out and then you figure out how to sort of manifest things that you want in your life. And, and that opportunity, that transition, you know, allowed me to do that. So I, I jumped from job, I did like two years at one place. You know, I think Davis, I was there for less than a year because it was contract. They didn't have the budget to renew, but mm -hmm. I'm still cool with them. And they're always inviting me back to go work. And I'm like, well, at this point, I'm on to <laughs> something else, you know, and then even yeah. leaving Long Beach, you know, I did my time. But I, while I was there, I was building the whole time. So, you know, 2018, 2019 were really hectic, but worth the investment. I probably had the least amount of sleep in my life those two years. Mm -hmm. but it was worth it because it, it got me to where I am now, you know? So I would encourage everybody, if, you, if you've got something that you want to pursue, take that, like step away and go do it. 
you know, and, yeah, and I respect you. You're not coming at it from a, a dogmatic approach, right? Like our parents, yeah. I agree with you. <laughs> they take the big risk. And then some of them, even like my dad, he's been an entrepreneur for 40 years in West mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But then yeah. because they've taken that, they take Shout it. Shout out to so Brooke that, too. I've seen Brooke yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> mange, mange, yeah. <laughs> mange uh, <laughs> he might, he might be watching. I know he called. Oh, word. Him. Okay, I, cool. I, try, I try to get him on the program so we could, we could talk on him too. I need to send him <laughs> a message and just say what's up. Hit him That's up. I hit guy. him up all the time. The Same. Mayor of Westwood. <laughs> we, we were exchange, <laughs> we've been exchanging maps recently, different maps about really? because of some of the controversies back home. Yeah. Ah, and different okay. arguments people have been having. Okay. Um, but yeah, he, he's a him and my dad are very funny because they are some of the most knowledgeable people I know who do not like to voice their opinion. You you gotta wrangle them to get an opinion out of them. And that's yeah. that's taught me a lot too because Sign if anything, I got the opposite. Yeah, yeah, I got the opposite yeah. tendency. You know what I'm saying? I feel I, you I, know <laughs> that's, that's a good point because like yesterday I had I met up with one of my old professors, and, uh -huh. and he's like at this point he's like a family friend. Yeah, and he was in the Black Studies department at Long Beach State, but he's a he's a trained psychologist. His background, his doctorate's in psychology, but he's got tons of different degrees. Like he has an MBA, JD from UCLA. He's got multiple master's degrees from Boston University, like Afro-American studies, social work, English, like he's all, all over the place. And we were talking about that and how, how when you sort of, when you come into your consciousness, and for me, I was definitely taught my history in the household compared to a lot of other people, but it was my time in school at the university that really allowed me to cultivate that even further. And he was one of the people who was very, very supportive of that. And I told him, I said, you know, when I first sort of came into this light, I wanted to tell everybody, and share <laughs> yeah. with everybody. The zeal. And I got beat down for it. You yeah. know, and, and yeah, you, you're, 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 you're zealous. And, uh -huh. and, and then you realize, you know what, actually, when you mature into that a little bit, you realize that the true wisdom is actually, you know, being grounded. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's very funny. You know, they, they were, they were all like Marxists explicitly, you know, and mm -hmm. they were organizing and they were members of the ruling class who wanted to get rid of the ruling class. I mean, there right. ain't no ifs, ands, or buts about it. All of our parents who came at the time that they came, oh, yeah, they weren't, they were not the poorest people. Yeah. Ethiopian you know? students, student union in North America. Like yes. my, my dad was in that. My, my yeah. uncles, my godfather, like every, everybody then and their they mother was up. in it. But they bucked up. Haile oh, Gerima. Right. They buckled up. They buckled up. And, you know, they started, you know, making cash and doing ventures and, and getting stability, you know, mm -hmm. which, you know, some of those like original ideals are different. But like, yeah, it's part of it is like just trying to get by and and see yeah. your kinfolk through your seed, you know, extend on to the next generation. So, you know, That's you right. and I appreciate that while still wanting to be able to carve out our, our own spaces, make make our marks of, of beauty in the world. But like. What yeah. I liked is, you know, me, I had some really like high paying jobs at these universities and I took these L's, you know, on purpose right. to pursue Same. things, even <laughs> knowing, but I, but I took like an immediate L. What I noticed about yeah. you is instead of trying to go like all out, like I thought I had to go all out entrepreneurial immediately. You mm -hmm. have these periods where you're like, I'm with the institution, I'm outside the institution, I'm on the institution as long as it's got these contracts and these things, like the way Nipsey would come back, you know, once yeah. he had some stock value to, to be negotiating better. And then you're like, right. I build, I'm building on the side the whole time. So like, it wasn't one or the other for you. You use them to get to the yes. ultimate goal. Absolutely. And I don't see that a lot. Yeah, and, and I think that it, it really dials down to taking inventory of what you have and utilizing your resources, which, which was a mind shift for me, I, you know, to be totally upfront. Uh -huh. I, w I had a mindset for a long period of my life as, you know, a teenager into early adulthood, I was always focused on what I didn't have. And that is probably the biggest thing that hampered uh, my ability to evolve. And it wasn't until I started really buckling down and then paying attention to actually all the resources that I did have around me. And that's just like a shift in consciousness that yeah. that I stumbled upon 
you know, after you mean like you were not a trust fund baby? Like, is that not? A, no, you, not at all. I mean? Yeah, like, like that's you what you're know, in comparison to. Right, right. And the you network know, and, you have, and I, and I, I would like to create resources so that my future children can launch off of that pad instead of a different one. Yet, you know, my parents did the best they could. Like, we, mm-hmm. I went to, you know, my my father worked in the hospitality industry, so he was in the private sector in you know the 70s and 80s and being you know an, an ethiopian male working in a white male dominated not just industry but just world in in general that's not easy no. and, and i didn't really understand that as a child but i can imagine the type of bigotry that my father dealt with when he came to america and then you know dealt with in in the workplace uh, subsequent to his arrival. So, you know, I grew up, you know, in a very, you know, middle class, upper middle class, white, conservative, Christian part of Southern California because of the location of my dad's job. Yeah, but that's crazy my, to think about. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. Bro, it, it, even it, in it, SoCal. It was a trip. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> that's what's different. <laughs> People think Southern California is a very liberal place. Let me tell you, that, that's not always, <laughs> that's far from the truth, you know? But, but I, I, had, I had access to resources. My mm-hmm. parents, because my, where my dad's job was located, we couldn't live in Los Angeles. That commute was a little, would have been hectic for him. Yeah. And my father was, and my mother were very bent on identifying really strong school districts we didn't have money to go to private school mm-hmm. and so you know i went to a school where they had resources you know this is the 80s into the 90s i got bussed out into a junior high school that was in a different town a neighboring town um and that really opened my eyes up to a whole lot of things i realized that the elementary school that i went to was truly middle class mm-hmm. and i did you know i i just thought everybody was you know, we were all the same. So I went to that junior high. Then I was like, oh, this is a different. This is a different. It's different. Beast. Yeah, much different beast. But, you know, I, I say that, that those were tools. Those were advantages. Those were opportunities. Those gave, you know, gave me the, the, the path to, to, to build. And I think that's important. You know, you, at some point, you got to shift your mindset. It's really, really easy to focus on what you don't have. Mm-hmm. If you can take inventory of what you do have, then you realize that you've got tools at your disposal that you can that you can use. I mean, you know, if you want to call it a guerrilla warfare perspective on things, maybe that's the case. Yeah. But I, 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 I really, I harnessed that. And then when I got to when I went to college, you know, and I was a community college student for two years. I didn't have my parents didn't have the money to send me directly um, to a four year. So. My thing was, all right, well, what's the resource I have? I can, mm-hmm. I delivered pizzas on the weekends. You know, I paid $12 a unit at that time. And, and for two years, basically paid my way through school without even knowing that had I filled out my financial aid paperwork, I could have had that paid for too. Dang. I didn't even know that, you know? Yeah. I was I'm just sure you got look. some discipline. I'm sure you got something out of that. Yeah, it really does. It, it helps you focus at a time where a lot of people that I knew at that time just weren't buckled down. And, yeah. you know, they were, yeah, I'm going to go to school and then eventually, you know, dropping out or taking forever to community college to finish because they just didn't have the discipline at that time. They weren't ready for it. And then they, college is rough like that. I, I did one semester yeah. in, the, in the middle of college, actually not even in the beginning, in the middle. Mm-hmm. And uh, the pace of a lot of the, you know cats I grew up with, it's a different pace. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to be really, so you, gotta, you, you do. And it, and it just, it takes discipline that I feel like the K through 12 system doesn't really do a great job instilling in its students. And I think that's one of the, the great tragedies of our educational system as it, exists right now is that you're not fully preparing people to go and do for self no. you're, you're creating robotic folks because i was one of them i had to deprogram nope. myself and when i Employees. transferred completely <laughs> come on man you already know so it's like 
it, you know, I, and then when I got to college, like I was a business major initially. And so my first semester, I was taking a bunch of upper division business courses, but I wasn't happy. I was kind of bored. The work was easy, but it, I wasn't really engaged. I took a woman's studies class, US Women of Color. And I got introduced to Peggy McIntosh and Bell Hooks. And I was like, oh, this is, this is dope. Like what they're writing, like these, these women are, are basically expressing how I felt growing up where I grew up, but I yeah. didn't have the vocabulary for it. And then I started branching out and identifying resources on campus. I found a black studies department and I was looking at their curriculum and I was like, got a class called the Revolt of the Black Athlete where they're reading Harry Edwards. And, and, and I was like, this is, this is amazing. The politics of black power where we're reading you know, Amos Wilson and watching Eyes on the Prize. And you know, I had to buy an Amos Wilson book, The Politics of Black Power, which is one of the thickest books that I ever had to buy in college, 800, 900 pages. Sheesh. And I, you know, I certainly didn't read the whole thing, but used it yeah. as a reference book. And it, you know, that I was like, I realized what my purpose was. And I was like, my purpose here is to get the knowledge and bounce. Yeah. That there's an, <laughs> I don't have no national flag, you know, that I'm waving, you know, in the name of my university. I, I wasn't going to the college football. We didn't have mm -hmm. a football team, but you know, I wasn't going to the basketball games, but my homies were on the basketball team and I was seeing yeah. how they were getting treated like slaves you know not they couldn't hold a job they they you know would they they had to figure out tricky ways to to get money funneled to them they're making you know, money off their ip it goes back to the year completely, Jeff point. they're making completely. money off their ip and they're not letting them get a cut like Bro, i think now they're is. talking about changing the rule i don't know exactly yeah the they've been i mean is. they've been talking about for a long time the, Man, if you look at the monies that are made by these institutions off of athletes who look like you and I, the fact that there's no cut being funneled to them at all is a gross robbery. It's really interesting. And again, that that's a whole topic you could do. Yeah. What's that <laughs> but, guy's name? I'm forgetting his name now. The Ball family, the the father. I remember he was trying to start his own league and he was going to pay these oh, kids. Oh, yeah. Um, he did the, I think the big baller brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, a lot I of people liked what he's a doing. lot of people I, knocked him and I was like, Yeah, I appreciate that he was trying to trying to branch out and do his own. You know, I, I feel like he's got to get credit for that. Like we were saying you know, with my professor yesterday and we were kind of chopping it up because he, he retired and moved overseas and he's back in the States and and, and <laughs> I you know, I was like, you know, a lot of people made a big deal about Booker T. Washington and thought he was a sellout. And mm -hmm. you know he and Du Bois had this so-called beef. But I was like, they're both kind of right though. Like, yeah, it, it's not yeah. one way to liberation. You, you need really multiple isn't. people doing yeah. multiple like the. But you need the action people, not the talking people. Thank you. <laughs> right? And that, that's exactly what I was about to say. Like you, we gotta we gotta build. And you know that I I I definitely crystallized my purpose. You know, at that point, from like the age of twenty to twenty three. I dove into a lot of books that, you know, I'm now, you know, basically looking at again mm -hmm. and, and, you know, going back to this book collection and saying, you know what, I should go back and read these books that I read when I was that age, because I'm going to get something from it again. And we were talking like my, my professor was talking about going back and reading France Fanon and he hadn't read France Fanon in years. And I mean, he's read. His I, books I haven't so read good. him, but I've had and so many friends recommend and I need to get so to that. So important to read his books. Uh, I mean, Cesar discourse on colonialism, you know, uh, black skin, white masks or is it black skin, white mask, black face, white mask, the wretched of the earth. Um, that's the one I heard about. The wretched yeah, of the earth. That's, that, the that's a very about. important. These are all very important books to read. And I, I think we need to really cherish the black academicians and intellectuals that that white society dismissed completely and said well the yeah, they're they're not correct and you know brush them under the rug these are the people who are doing the real liberation work you know so i say all that to say once i figured out what my purpose was i made that shift i i, I would say all right i'm always interested in entrepreneurship and business mm -hmm. i'm going to do political science let me sort of develop my consciousness and then you know, from there, let me get into maybe electoral politics and public service. So I worked on campaigns and things like that. And then I went to the DNC in 2008, uh -huh. in Denver, 
Yeah, the and convention? I a, yeah, I spent a week out there and it was the best experience I could have had because I came home and said, I, I, I don't want to be in politics. <laughs> <laughs> yo, yo, for people that have the context, look, Bro, that's yeah. the context of when Obama was finna be elected. This is the height. So that's, that this is, is so apex. fascinating. <laughs> That is so okay. fascinating. I, I was, look, I was one week too young to vote in that election mm. in November. One week, which is so really? crazy. I was 100% going to vote for him. Okay. It was a compromise. I wanted to vote for Kucinich at the time. I was entertaining oh, yeah. from the Republican side, uh, Ron Paul. I, the, mm -hmm. Some of the things that he was saying and criticizing the CIA with blowback and being against the Iraq war that had yeah. been going on for eight years. I was yeah. like, who is this old white gentleman He's against all this the stuff? Federal Reserve, I, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, that stuff was interesting to me. Yeah, and and for me, Obama was the compromise. But I was like, okay, and then you know, mm -hmm. for the optics of it, and if that's going to give people hope, okay, whatever. Yeah, and then you know, within the year, you know, and I was on a conservative campus at the time. I was at Pepperdine. Oh, I was bumping oh, yeah, Nas's right, black right, president yes. in a dead silent campus. You know what I'm saying? Dead I silent know campus. What you were going yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I, it took a while for me to be disillusioned. You were disillusioned yeah. in that year. Tell me about that. Bro, like I, like again, my, my experience in my youth, I was disillusioned in high school. Uh -huh. So my high school GPA was not good. You know, I had a, like a C plus. A. I think my, my senior year, we were supposed to go meet with my counselors, our counselors like that fall. And uh -huh. you get a printout of your, your transcript. My GP, my GPA was like a two point eight or something, and I and I knew, I I just been completely tired of applying myself to school. I was like, I'm in this school where I'm looked at like I'm some, you know, thug who doesn't belong here. I'm cool with people, but I'm not cool. Like I'm, I'm, I'm like I'm on my own. And that's so opposite of you too. Like that's like, <laughs> like you, you are not. I mean, at least the Macon and I know is not like the the hardest dude out there banging on people. No, like. not at all. Yeah, <laughs> man. Like I, you know, peace, I couldn't man. even imagine. Like, I'm cool. Like, I get along with people. Like I'm, I'm not trying to beef with nobody. But I, I didn't like the system I was in. It was very, very racialized, mm. and I thought that that was the norm. It wasn't until I got to Long Beach State that I realized. I had dealt with oppression in the school system my whole life. You just, you deal with it, you just kind of operate. So, you know, when I got to eventually this, this idea that I really wanted to get into politics, it was really about public service. That, that's mm -hmm. really, that was, all, that, that was all that I wanted to do. And I got to the DNC and I was like, this ain't nothing but a celebrity show, man. <laughs> Every, like politicians are just celebrities. And, and the coolest conversation I had was with the then governor of New York, David Patterson. Do you mm -hmm. remember him? There's a brother. I who, remember the he, name. He I was, not, he was I don't, legally I don't know blind. about them. Really yeah, oh, fascinating dude. Oh, he was the, the black gentleman. Yeah, he was yes, lieutenant yes, governor. I remember him. And then Spitzer got in trouble. Yes, with the prostitute and, ring. And then he, he got a job with MSNBC. Oh yeah, that's right. He had a shit. Like he became like a, a little like a host, not a little. Yeah. You know, he did his thing, right? So yeah. the like the governor of New York, David. The, the, I remember him. Cool dude. dude, I met him in the lobby bar. We just chopped it up, bro. Him and his aide, mm -hmm. and he was like, you know, I think his lineage is that his father was in electoral politics in New York, and he was like, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "Man, I, I'm really interested in public service. Like, I, I'm." I'm I'm happy to be here, but it's also strange because it feels like it feels like Hollywood, you know. And I'm I'm in LA, bro. Like the, all yeah. the celebrity culture, like I don't really rock with this. So to find <laughs> it here, I was like, oh, it's the same thing over here, you uh, know. And and he was like, man, I didn't think I would be in electoral politics at all. My family was in it, but you know, I kind of answered the call and jumped in. And, and you know, he was like, if there's anything I can do for you. You know, stay in touch. He gave me his business card, and you know, and I, and I, I just remember we were in the California delegation hotel. It's downtown Denver. It's at the Sheraton. So if you can imagine who all the California politicians are, particularly yes. the Democrats, obviously, yes. you yeah. can imagine who was there. Everybody and their mama was up there, and it was yeah. like you would see them, like they were all in the lobby hanging out, or like you would see the CNN like pundits. Who were hanging out in the in the hotel or you know michelle obama spoke in like one of their convention halls and 
I happened to, <laughs> I'm tall. Yeah. And I was, there was a really short, frail white woman that was in front of me trying to look into the doorway because the room was packed where Michelle Obama was speaking. And I, 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 I might have stepped on her heel. I, I don't know. Uh -oh. <laughs> but like she turned around and I looked down. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. And I, you know, I did one of those glances where I apologized real quick, but I wasn't paying attention. And yeah. then I looked down again and it was Amy Goodman from Democracy oh. Now. So we started like talking. I was like, you know, I really like what you do. And I, I've really, I've been watching you for a long time. And, and I, I just told her how much I appreciate it. And, you know, she's frail and, and she was like, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. She was, she was like, I'm trying to get in, but they won't let me in. And I was like, you know, Damn. independent media is, is rough. Yeah. But it, it was seeing that celebrity culture there that kind of just made me go, this ain't the way, man. Like, maybe I need to get into education because at the end of the day, I want to impact people directly. Mm -hmm. And that's what I thought I was going to do in electoral politics. And I realized that that wasn't the case. Man, you saw that early on. I see people getting on uh, Mark Lamont Hill because he mm -hmm. voted for Jill Stein, you know, as a vote of conscience back in 2016. Oh, and okay. they're not, you know what I mean? They're not seeing what what you're seeing in terms of some people have called it kayfabe. They called it like pro wrestling. And, you know, with the addition <laughs> of like Trump, who actually was Bro, in pro wrestling straight up. and now Kanye announcing that he's finna get in the race too. I mean, it is oh, what you saw yeah. 12 years ago. Like Bro, that's one of the then one of the things that I did early on when I got into college was I turned off mainstream media because I realized how much I was being programmed through it. And mm -hmm. I initially was watching pro or outlets like Link TV. I'm not I, don't, I don't know if they're still around, but at the time they were based in San Francisco. If you can imagine what Pacifica Radio represents with like KPFK and KPFA up in, up in Berkeley, Mm -hmm. They were sort of the television network version. Okay. So doing a lot of fun drives, but really introducing yeah. viewers to other journalists that that you know, like John John Pilger, um, who who done a lot of um, work around issues related to Africa and colonial rulers, um, you know, and I, I got introduced to different documentaries and documentarians and things like that, and. And I was like, wow, I'm really deprived watching CNN or, <laughs> you know, a Fox News yeah. or an MSNBC. These, you know, these corporate media networks, they've got their own agenda. And the masses of our people, I realize the masses of our people don't understand that. No, they don't. So, That's all I'm laughing. Like you're red pilling them right now. And I was <laughs> cracking up. I was like, yo, we gotta, we gotta get away from this. This is not the way, man. And That's like real. I like, you know, at my, I would be at my parents' house and, and, you know, they would sort of have the TV on without mm -hmm. really paying attention to it. And I said, this ain't it. Like I can read through it now. Now I'm, I'm, I'm deep in my poli sci studies. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm taking like black studies classes as well. So I'm learning about different things from multiple perspectives. And I was like, yo, we, we gotta, we gotta rethink this. The two party system makes absolutely no sense. And, Zero. and I really credit a class called political parties. You know, the name is the name says it all. My 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 final year, my senior year in upper division class, where I realized what the role of the political parties were. You know, and they 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 present this opposing narrative to the public, but in real life, that's not exactly how they operate. And yeah, I did, I did parliamentary debate. And one of the fakest things they do is when they say that there's a debate on the floor. When there's a debate on, right. there's no debate on the floor. No. They make all the decisions behind the scenes. Thank you. They, they will not bring it to the floor unless they know they have the right amount of votes. And then yeah. and only then will they, will they take the <laughs> they do so. Exactly. And it's like, you know, like you just got to open your mind up and be open to it. And I'm somebody, at the end of the day, it really boiled down to, I was the child that always asked why. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, my parents never dismissed me, right? That's and, and, and my even my mother, like particularly in her case, she'd tell me if she didn't know the answer. She'd straight up say, I don't know. And it wasn't dismissive. She was like, you'll be able to figure it out. You know, I don't have that answer, but you'll be able to figure it out. So I was always seeking the truth. What's, what's really happening? What's really going on? And 
making use of that, I think has really served me in my life as a tool. You know, I used to think I was like, well, I'm just, maybe I'm just a little restless. It is the restlessness because I'm, I want to know what's really happening. What have I been mm -hmm. conditioned to understand? And then what's the, what's the real, real, you know, because you know, your conquerors are going to rewrite history and, and they're going to advance a certain narrative, but what's, what's the absolute truth. So I say that to say, you know, the DNC really opened me up to the celebrity culture of the electoral <laughs> process and who's cool and who it was very much like a popular kids club it reminded me of yeah. like high school at break time in the senior quad like who's who hangs out with this crew who rolls with that crew and do you listen to or do you know who immortal technique is yeah for so sure when i, I was in dc him. yep i love him i since 04. That's a yeah. lot of how I got conscious early on was listening to him like yes. dancing the devil when I was like 13 or 14. Well, I probably shouldn't have been listening to that song. Yeah, no, but, but uh, music is so powerful. <laughs> it does that. You know, music oh, did that super. for me. Yeah. Super. And and he the thing about him is he doesn't want you to just regurgitate what he's saying. Mm -hmm. He always says fact check him on anything. Oh, he always says fact you. check him. And right. and you know sometimes it's straight up, whereas sometimes it's it's a narrative. But I was seeing him live for the second time. I had seen him years before in the oh, Rock really cool. I've, I've series. Never, I've never been able to do that. That's dope. Oh, I seen him thrice. I saw him for my birthday a couple years ago in L.A. out in Hollywood. Okay. I saw him uh, San Bernardino once or twice, and then I saw him in D.C. when I was working for Kucinich. No. And you said the DNC, the dude who works at the front desk of the DNC, he goes from office to office. Mm -hmm. He recognized me. I was still in my suit. I went right after work. Oh, really? He's like, he's like, yo, he's like, yo, <laughs> I didn't think anybody who works with the DNC was finna yeah. be at an immortal technique concert. Like it was unexpected, you know, like yeah. you got the mosh pit people, you got so many different kinds of For cats, sure. you know, it's so important. When you I mean, say like that the truth about is that. the truth, you know, I was, I registered as a Democrat in 2000 and voted for Al Gore. That was the first time I was able to vote. And then in 2000, so after I took that political parties class, probably in that same semester, I moved to a, a DTS, decline of state voter, which is typically jumbled into the independent mm -hmm. sort of label. Yeah, tell but me the difference. It's not, I'm not, it's not to be confused with the, the American independent party. I didn't become a, like a member of that party. I just yes. became decline of state. I was like, I'm voting based on issues because yeah. this, this whole political party stuff doesn't make sense. And the only political party that I ever thought that came even close to dealing with issues that black people would benefit from was probably the Green Party. You know, and, and while I'm not a member of it, like when I, when I first read their platform, I was like, oh, our people would really benefit from this, but you're not going to get exposed to that, you know, certainly no. not in mainstream media. And, you know, God bless the Democrats and Republicans. They, they need some help. because <laughs> it's And people who follow For them real. religiously, I think, need some, some searching. You, you used know, the word I really time. liked earlier, and I'm, I'm uh, listening to an audiobook now. You said you're an audiobook guy by the mm. guy named Michael Malice, and he, he says the same thing as you when you, in terms of programming from the media. He says yeah. those people, when they're programming you in the, in the corporate media, what they're doing is like he gave an analogy of Super Mario Brothers. Mm. He said they're like the Goombas in the video <laughs> game. <laughs> you know, they got a program. They're really running. They're are. executing the program. Yep. You know, they're trying to attack you, whatever you're trying to do, and they're not going to operate outside of that program. So never, <laughs> never. You know, I I got introduced to um, um, why did I just forget his name? Noam Chomsky, when I was about yeah. twenty one. Yep. And Same. I remember like my, my buddy in college at the time, we actually sat next to each other in one of our classes. He had gone to, to go see Noam speak. And I was like, yo, like I'm seeing this dude like on Link TV and Amy Goodman interviews him, but like I haven't read any of his books. Like what do I need to get into? Like put me on game. And he has a docu, there's a documentary that centers around one of his writings about media and oh, I'd love to see it. Yeah, I yeah. It. I'm. Man. I've read his, I've read some of his writings. Like I used to read him and antiwar.com every day when I was there. Oh, but okay, I haven't yeah. seen any. I haven't seen any of his uh, documentaries for, for whatever. The name will come to me, but but he's the one I credit for like helping me really assess what I was watching and what I was being fed. And I used to get that in hip hop, 
right? There are mm -hmm. a lot of hip hop. There's a, a, a legacy of hip hop artists who have been outrightly conscious and, and put the nuggets of wisdom in their music. Chuck and D, KRS One. For sure, you know, Brand New being like in X Clan, like so many people, Poor Righteous Teachers, and, and, and they were always talking about like, you know, tell live vision, like what, what is it doing to you? There's a reason why they call it programming. Like, you know, but I wasn't, I, I guess I just wasn't ready to receive all of that at the time, even though that I count that as like a base of, of my Kanye's root. message in college dropout. I wish I understood it at the time. Man, it took me years that was my to understand year, that. bro. And I almost dropped out of college that year. I was at my mom's house writing a paper and I, I was sitting at her kitchen table. She was in the kitchen and she was like, she was like chopping onions or something. She was like yeah, making what, whatever, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, like, and I was writing this paper and, and I was taking this class called Politics of Development, which was a fascinating, fascinating class. I got introduced to Edward Said. We read Culture and Imperialism, which is an excellent book. I would encourage everybody to read it. Um, he, he wrote another book that we didn't read in that class, but it's really good called Orientalism. And I read John Maley's book called Hungry for Trade, which now is a 20 year old book, but so important to read even today. Yeah. And I had to write, a, I was writing a paper and I did well writing papers in college, but I didn't like the process. And I was like, man, I'm trying to be a music executive. I got these internships at these record labels. I don't give a <laughs> damn about college. Like this is whack. I'm only doing yeah. it for my parents. So I was like, I think I'm gonna drop out. My mom was like, well, why don't you? And I was like, what? The? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is this, like reverse Savage. psychology? Which, yeah, yeah, I was like, my mom's not into reverse psychology. So she's like, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. And I was like, well, is she messing with me? Like, I don't know, because my father would not be like that at all. And I was like, you know what? I got one semester left. That would be foolish just to, to give it up. But, you know, the, those, those books really helped me understand things geopolitically. Yeah, and the music you were saying, too. <laughs> incredible yeah i mean people like brand nubian talking about spirituality in their music you know krs one two a lot of those guys who are like five percenters i mean yeah when you're talking about god body and and you're saying peace god and you're hearing the wu-tang clan or jizza from you know, years ago but then you got jay Lex dropping the album now and right bringing and he's return of the about five percenters. god in the music yeah <laughs> like and i'm like man this is this is powerful stuff and, and uh, i appreciated it appreciated it at the time. And I thought, well, you know what? I, I really got fed something very special, you know, at that, in that period at a young age. Cause I was, I started listening to hip hop when I was a kid, you know, and I didn't have access to a lot of like tapes and CDs, but it was mm -hmm. because of, I have an uncle who's probably about 17 or 18 years older than me. Yeah. And he came to live with us when he came from Ethiopia. And eventually like in the mid to late eighties, when we moved and we would go back and visit him, you know, he had a, a you know, cool Mustang GT, like, Dang. you know, coupe. In Ethiopia? Like, no, no, this is, this oh. is in, the, in the States. Like oh, after, okay. like when he had moved out and kind of did. I see, I see. I thought you meant like move back to Ethiopia. I was like, that's nah. gangster. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? That'd be something else. Uh. And, you know, he, he was listening to a lot of music. So I got introduced to a lot of music through that. My mother is really into music. I, you know, mm -hmm. she had Bobby Brown albums in 1987, 88, you know? So th just kind of being immersed in things like that and then getting cable, which was pivotal for me. We, had, we got cable when I was in third grade and I remember coming home from school and having this like chocolate colored box on top of our television. It was like <laughs> we had all these channels all of a sudden and yeah. you know, Yo MTV Raps was really my gateway to, to a lot of music on the East Coast that I wasn't privy to out here. And you know, brand Nubian, you know, all for one. That album is is a powerful album. You know, they're they're talking about wake up, you know, black they're talking about the black man, wake up. You gotta think like, you know, you hear like they they they've influenced so many artists that now looking back I realized that back then I didn't I didn't really appreciate the way I should have. Like how you much know? influence they had over other people. So much. I mean you know, Dip Diver, Civilizer 85, or I mean, just J Electronica taking that from Grand Puba, mm -hmm. you know? They, so the, getting that spirituality, I think was really, really important um, for me at a young age. And then yeah. building upon it, 
when I was sort of ready to receive again. I feel like everybody can develop their consciousness when they're ready to. Yeah, you, know? you need that repetition. People yes. sometimes, you know, we focus as creatives so much on the creative element. I was going back and friend uh, with a, a cousin of mine. She's funny. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we did the Amharic program in nine weeks and that's once mm. a day. She said she knows how to teach Amharic and she's born and raised here just like us. Wow. She said she knows how to teach it in 10 days. And I was like, yo, that's crazy. And we what? were talking about different. Yeah, yeah. She Sign me up for that. <laughs> bro, <laughs> bro she's, she's amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> She she got a PhD in memory, man, in like sci the psychology of of memorization. So I believe her. She's a, what? She's a professor. Are you yeah, That's powerful. she's a professor out here in SoCal. Okay. Um, so yeah, shout out to Bethel Lehem, uh, <laughs> Professor Bethel Lehem. Yeah, yeah, you yes, know her. God. Yes. Okay. So crazy. You know her. We yeah. Were, I was That's my cousin. To work one one morning, uh -huh. and she pulled up like next to me, and she was going uh -huh. to work too. And that was the last time I saw her actually on the like driving, driving yeah. down the road. Like her and Baruch are old friends too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. She's sweet. Same I haven't old, seen her in a long crew. time. Man. We were all on Abashad.com forums in the early 2000s. Shut I don't up. know if you were ever on there. No, I don't even know that existed. Imagine me, you're, bro. You're because I'm like, right I'm now. like, bro, I'm like eight years younger than all these kids. <laughs> but I had uh, my cousin, another cousin of mine, he was living with me at the time and he's their yeah. age. Right. Okay. And, um, and so if this is like early internet, 02, 03, 04. And before like anything, this is like one of those early chat spaces where Habashas used to link up and then we would talk wow. about and link up at the tournaments that would happen. Of course. And uh, I, th I think I had a picture of a uh, Riza's Afro Samurai as my icon. Mm, yeah. And uh, I think, I think at one point I was Negro Damas on there. And then another point I was uh, <laughs> the Ya'alam Nagus, the king of the world. <laughs> well, whatever ridiculous little like preteen, teen stuff. That's important though. Yeah. You, know, you gotta get your, get your mind right behind that. That's dope. I, yeah, I appreciate man. that. Uh, that, that Fish for Saha, he's a poet. He used to be on there. Mm, Elia, Elias is the burnt face, the music guy. He was on there as the prophet. There were a lot of cats, uh, man. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I was not privy to that at that time. That's funny. When it, I was I was a college student at that time. I was like, yeah, yeah, definitely. Those them too, bro. Years. I was a teenager talking yeah, so to they college were really students. Yeah, they really on it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> some discourse and that's dope. I really I I appreciate that. That's important. Yeah. So so y'all met that way randomly. The who. who? You and Betty, who teaches in 10 days. Well, like, I didn't even, you know, I didn't know that, I man, I met her years ago, probably maybe through some sort of tournament or, I don't even know how we met, but I, like, we've known each other for a really long time and I hadn't seen her in years. So when, when we pulled up, I was like, oh my God, like, this is so serendipitous, like the it's, fact yeah. that that happened. Oh, That's serendipity so cool. is so big in my life, man. So mm -hmm. big. And uh, yeah, well, I'm going to have to get her on the show too to talk about that. Yeah, but that yeah. repetition, her and I had a little back and forth chopping it up about the role of like repetition in, in terms of, of learning. She, mm -hmm. I think, puts a little bit less value on it than I do. But um, okay. sometimes you need that base, right? You need to have heard that message for it to register later. So maybe yeah. when you hear it again later, it wouldn't have registered if you didn't have that base that you were talking about in your childhood where, where you heard it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's for her to have that that background and that and that skill set, I think is critical. Like I said, if she did a class, I'd do it. <laughs> two days, right. give me that. Let me let me. I'm sure I can build something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you I mean, you got you. What was motivating you? What was going on in your head back in the time? I think there was about um, oh, when we did nine, that class, nine students. Yeah, about nine <laughs> students, ranging Man. from early twenties to late 30s ranging from native yeah. born ethiopians to diaspora born and raised ethiopians it was a pretty diverse class like what yeah. what and it was at uh asla vegan another mm -hmm. cousin that was yeah. setting shout that up at Nez. shout out to Nez Anet, yeah. yeah and now, now she's in lamert too that, uh, that's right i just saw her <laughs> last week 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 before yeah yeah it's been yeah. A, it's been longer than that for me but like what what were you thinking in in terms of learning the the fidel or the the alphabet you know you know the good alphabet and picking up amharic vocabulary by that last class i'm pretty sure you were at that last class we we had y'all writing sentences yeah yeah and now what was that like six years ago now five six years ago yeah something like it's been that. a while that yeah. i mean for me my motivation was the void of not being able to do much of that i you know my my mother worked really hard to try and teach us 
but it was difficult when everyone's working a full-time job and you're raising two kids. And we didn't have, I didn't have grandparents in the household for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. And I realized how valuable that is because there were so many other of my peers who, who did, who yeah. like have memories of growing up with their grandmother or something like that. Or, you know, from the time that they were a baby, the grandmother was in the house too, or maybe grandfather or whatever. I had my maternal grandmother visited us for a brief period of time when I was like maybe in third or fourth grade, but she didn't stay with us that long. And, you know, I was in school and there was kind of a language barrier. I could always understand what people were saying to me, yeah. but the challenge was always conjugating and then responding. Speaking back. I've, yeah. I, I've seen that. It's only anecdotally. I don't have some sort of research study to, to back it, for but sure. I've seen that with a huge, huge anecdote. And it yeah. seems to be the comfortability of the parents to, to not want to compel the child to respond. So you, mm -hmm. you get comfortable practicing and it's just like, whatever you practice is how you're going to be on the yeah. test. And so it's that, very that's one way. Getting you. Exactly. Right. It's very unilateral. So in, in exactly. even in my dad's case, he didn't want us to learn on heart. Really? Yeah. He thought it would that's confuse interesting. us in our, in our sort of quest to assimilate. Yeah. You know, in, you know, once I got to college, I was like, man, assimilation is BS. This is whack. <laughs> you know, but uh, but I, I I appreciate his stance, even though mm -hmm. it was detrimental. And you know, he he years later recognized that that wasn't the way to go. Yeah. But he he again in good faith, he wanted to ensure that my brother and I could compete with you know. With our it, peers. it makes sense, and I think yeah. they're right. By the way, but I think they're right think so for too. a very short time, and you for get sure. over it. Like yes. that initially, you're going to be worse off. And some people they even stick you into like a ESL or ELL class. Oh, for you know sure. because that, of that. that existed a lot when I was a kid. You know, I, I yeah. was telling my girlfriend the other day that that um, my I, in second grade I volunteered to be like the helper student for that for, class. For, for someone who had just come from the Philippines, uh -huh. you know, and, and she basically, for the rest of the school year, she sat next to me. She didn't speak any English, she could hardly understand anything. And I was like, I showed her the way for yeah. the entire school, for the rest of that school year when she arrived. And I remember she would have to go to the ESL classes and then come back and then catch up with us and find what page we were on in the textbook and things like that. Um, and I remember a lot of that. And then working in LAUSD, I would see how students from Mexico and El Salvador at the age of five and six were fluent in Spanish, but then could work as the interpreters between the teacher and their parent. And I yeah. was like, man, okay, my, my, my parents, particularly my dad, I know he, his intent was good, but mm -hmm. it actually would not have been a problem. You might have maybe stumbled a little bit early on yeah. but as much tv as we were watching you pick it up like, yeah. we would pick it up very quickly i right i there. have friends from the french school in addis ababa mm. who oh lycée yeah lycée france okay. gabra mariam shout yeah. out to the <laughs> gabra mariam i have My a lot of friends went from there. there her, her dad yeah there it's yeah. a big famous school mm -hmm. and there's even a difference between among them exactly what you said the ones of them because it's predominantly a french system but some right. of them could take English if they want to. And it, but it, in addition to, it's people who read books, not because the class assigns it, but, but for fun. And people yeah. who listen to and immerse themselves in the movies. Yes. Like more. Those sure. people, I know a few of them, even though born and raised in Ethiopia, most people would not be able to tell the difference. You would not know they were not a native English speaker. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Over time, you just got yeah. to take that time. I remember my, my second trip to Ethiopia my mom's friend was like, you've been here for a while. Like, don't, don't forget your ability to speak what you can speak. And I was like, yeah, no, I won't. And then like gradually I fell back into my old ways. And so that was another impetus for, for me taking that class. And I think a lot of it, like, you know, um, everyone, there's so many of us in that class that it was really fun because we were all like, man, we got to, we've got this void to fill. We've got to figure this out, you know? And, and I'm still committed to that. I haven't been consistent, you know, yeah, yeah. but 
Well, I'm, I'm, it's a, it was a short time, you know, and once a week sure. is, is is difficult. You know, most language classes are like four times a week, so you, you know yeah. it was a, it was a good base, and um, yeah, I, I I hope to maybe do more things like that. I got one of my boys who's working on a on a project. He was on my my show recently, and he's in oh, ed cool. tech. Like he's in oh, tech and he's like, he's like me in terms of Amharic. And so he's trying to make more apps and, you know, some more tools digital things tools. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I we, really we like the, the app or the website or whatever it was that, that, that was Agi. Ag yeah, Ag Ag Aziz. Agi. My yeah. sister, Ag Aziz Aziz had the, she had the UCLA connection. That, that, was, that was another helpful. usage of the institution yes. for our extra institutional learning. Again, you That's gotta use example. it that way. That's so important. And it, I mean, that should be, the purpose with a lot of things that we're doing because we're we're coming from a place of lack in terms of resources but certainly not lack in terms of spirit and in in divinity yet you got to utilize the resources and take inventory of what you have and and make things out of it and really empower yourself through that so i that class was really, really good. Plus, it was nice to connect with everybody in that sense, too. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Because oh, people yeah. would always like, well, you know, you don't want to be in a hard class with kids. And, and I was like, <laughs> I don't care about that. I'll show up to Yeah, know, the churches what? still teach it. And yeah. there, there are some people teaching online. They're actually teaching even the traditional um, things like the whole priest school. There are a couple wow. of people starting it fully online now. That's amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. more resources, the better, man. I always... When I was used to stay at my cousin's, I'd always be like, man, how come we don't have our own schools? What's going on, bro? Like, tell Ooh, me. Because, he, he, you know, he's, he's a lot older than me. And, mm -hmm. and you know, like, I have a, a really good friend that I used to work with who's Armenian. And she, she grew up in little Armenia here mm -hmm. in, in L.A. And her husband is indigenous. He's Native American. And they send their daughter to an Armenian school. Yep. You know, and I was like, yeah, well, how come we, we need to do that? Bro? There are like, a lot in the we... valley. There are a lot in the valley. There are a couple out here. Yeah. The, you you know? know what? The thing about Armenians and Jews and Persians, who are three different ethnic groups, I've seen do this very well. Not mm -hmm. not just with their own schools, their own grocery store, their own doctor, their Everything. own parts. Come and on, Syrians, Syrians to some extent. You know, when yep. you see the Pico area is locked down by Jewish folks, you see Burbank mm -hmm. and Glendale. It's like Armenians and Syrians sure, and huh? uh, Persians. They even got what, elected officials from those yeah, districts too. You what, look at absolutely. What I see them doing it's a little bit different and it's part of the the powder keg right now in ethiopia it's like on paper we got 87 languages in ethiopia realistically we got like two major religious differences like the christianity and islam and then within right. that there are some subdivisions and then really it's like three to six languages that have more than a million speakers right. whereas you know the Jews is like just Hebrew and just yeah. Judaism. Mm -hmm. The Armenians, it's just the Armenian Orthodox Church, which is communion right. with us. And it's just the Armenian language. Mm -hmm. The Persians, it's just Farsi. Like it's right. like they're focused on on the one That's thing. Right. So we need to just organize and 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 do that thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I see us getting divided that way. Kind, of, it's it's almost like the diversity yeah. in a way is holding us back when when we're not you know, using right. it to flourish. Cause we can yeah. easily make an academy with more than one language or something. For like sure. That. Well, you know, and, and I think that, that the point you make is, is critical. That diversity should be the strength. It shouldn't be what divides us, you know, because there's a richness in everything. And I think that, you know, for us sort of lacking certain resources and maybe not operating as collectively as we could, that's probably the place to start, you know? Yeah. I, and, <laughs> That that might sound ideological to people, and and, and maybe it no, is it's real. Crazy, it's real. It's very practical. Uh, it, it, it literally is the solution. There's a guy named Professor Musfin who used to say, "Why do you think we're not so good at soccer, but we're good at running?" It's like running is an individual sport. <laughs> it doesn't take the collective. <laughs> he murdered us, bro. That isn't that the truth? Imagine yeah. that. You know, and I think there's a lot of work that that we can do, and it really. And then really cultivating that to the best of our ability, you know? Yeah. So part part of that, 
part of that, let's let's go in and segue into this. Is we we talked all this time about it. Let's talk about your projects, bro. I know you got the the SoundCloud. Tell us about yeah. your SoundCloud and tell us about some of your projects. And I know you mentioned hip hop by name, but I know you're a pretty eclectic brother. What what type of genres are you into, and and what type of work and and the production stuff you said as well earlier? Yeah, yeah. So with on the SoundCloud, it's interesting. Like I I put up like two old mixes. They're now they're pretty they're a few years old. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the mixes that I've made, I've actually sat on. So SoundCloud has been a cool tool for me to just put stuff out when I feel like it. You know, and initially when I, when I had the radio show, when I was doing musical massage, I realized how, how powerful SoundCloud was back in like 2012, 2013. And mm -hmm. so I would upload whatever show recordings that I could get a hold of because that was the other thing working in sort of a, a radio station that was managed, you know, to a, at a certain level that probably could have been better. It was like retrieving show recordings and computer systems sort of shutting down and missing thing, things that I had done. And I was like, all right, well, that didn't get recorded. It's out in the ether somewhere. So I, I began to just put stuff up on there and then just DJing around town. And, and that kind of led me to opportunities to kind of be more expressive, you know, out in the public. And, and do yeah, that, that's, that itself is diverse. I know you've been in some places in downtown, but I remember one of the last times I seen you live and I didn't want to, you know, bug you in the middle of your craft, but it was cool to finally see you in that space was at a house party. <laughs> sorry, sorry, you cut out. What'd you say? I, said most people, I appreciate that because most people don't understand that. Like they- No, they don't. They'll try to get offended by it. They really do. And I'm just like, I can't talk right now but yeah i knew exactly yeah it was with habasha la it was one of these house party things that you were doing at the yo yeah yeah that was like 2015 that's actually that's funny that's yeah that wasn't that was an interesting interesting day in, the, in terms of like the people i was able to meet and everything like it's funny how things come full circle but you know the it was hip-hop hip-hop was always the base for me mm -hmm. you know and I'm thankful that my parents had the record collection that they did. Much of it was sort of acquired before I was thought of. You know, I felt like <laughs> my, my parents were really hit before I came along. Yeah. And it's not that they aren't, but it was like, you know, they, they were fly. And they they kind of had their, their young adult lives that they were leading before they, they linked up and, and decided to have kids. But, you know, I, I grew up on a steady dose of a lot of funk and soul music in addition to the hip hop, which I was experiencing in real time. And I'm thankful that I had that because, you know, hip hop today is a lot different than what I was used to coming up. You know, when I was eight years old, like I said, like we talked about, I listened to Brand Nubian, Public Enemy, KRS-One, Rakim, Queen Latifah. I mean, you know, talk about a, a, a very dignified, being in her in terms of the music and what she stood for and so that like i built i built myself on that and then that branched out into like discovering jazz music and trying to figure out who everyone was sampling in oh the yeah music, right and oh, at yeah. that time everyone was sampling a lot of james brown and a lot of parliament and funkadelic and then you know albums like illmatic come out and you're like okay pete rock is flipping a jamal well who is a jamal and then I, I dive into, you know, this and, you know. It's an invitation. Like, the sample is an invitation for you to see the crazy. original. Yeah. And you're like, wow, I, I was missing out on P-Funk and, 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 you know, Dexter Gordon and all these different musicians from a variety of, of genres that I, I really admire and respect you to this day. Like, that's a lot of the music I listen to. I kind of went backwards and decided to discover a lot of the stuff that had already been out. Oh yeah, but Chocolate you talk about a Parliament and Funkadelic, Chocolate City. I I use that terminology, and uh, one of my Mexican friends, he he said he uses it as an opening line with people, and yeah. he says it, it works every time. It throws people off, like that's, referring that's to like DC, I, Chocolate yeah. City, like exactly. That's <laughs> I was just about to say that. That's how I learned of DC. Yeah. Like, I, of DC being so black because everyone called it Chocolate City. Chocolate City. We, and we got a lot of Chocolate Cities now. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> looking at across the country and you see where the numbers are really high, which I, I think is is serves as a base to really do some good work. Mm -hmm. um, 
but the DJing, like I used to use a program called Fruity Loops when I was in college and I was like making beats off of that. Yeah. And I didn't know how to use the program very well, but I liked what I made and I was like, this is, this is really dope. In fact, even before that, when I was in high school, I had um, I, a friend of mine, this white kid who was a skater and he was, he was into uh, this group called Living Legends, and he was living. He was listening to Murs, and like, you oh know, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, really, I like, drove Murs, bro. Name drop. I drove him in, in Lyft in my Lyft shows. <laughs> he still lives in South LA somewhere. <laughs> he's, been, yeah, no, he's, he's dope. He, but I, I went to his Pay Dues concerts too. I love his independent hip hop back in the day. I love that, that he did that too. We need more people like him to do things like that, and you know, build our own institutions. And he had the, this cat Kyle. He had this program called Hip Hop EJ. I was like mm -hmm. 17 and you know, I had my little gateway com 2000 computer or whatever and I upload the program. And it was just a sequencer where you were sequencing samples. And I was like, oh, is this how these people produce music? I didn't know anything about music production. And I just figured this is how people were doing it because I was making it kind of sound like what they were doing. And yeah. I was like, dope, I need, to, I need to get into this. And then I kind of, I abandoned it, you know, because I like, I got into reading a lot of things and my political and social consciousness was, was evolving and I had these internships at these record labels and I was like, you know what, maybe I need to put that on the back burner. There's bigger stuff that I, I need to focus on. And it's weird now because like I've come back to it. Yeah. You know, and like learning programs, like thankfully, like my girlfriend was like, she, she got me Serato Studio for Christmas nice. and I like immediately jumped into it and then like, fell off of it and i was like let me why am i not playing with this this is a cool toy you know yeah and, some and just quarantine having, education straight up <laughs> you know what I mean? like having friends who were making beats or other friends who were djing and then people in the business that i knew that were artists or working in the business in some capacity i was like you know what like i'm too connected to this to not be interested in this at all so between that and the djing and making mixes i just i love music and and you know I, I have a sincere interest in instrumentation that i abandoned when i was a kid i played trumpet when i was a kid and then i i left that for you know other things and it's funny how you yeah. just go back to what really piques your interest the most you know but i love i love jazz music i'm a jazz head i love john coltrane and and Alice Coltrane too, they're two of my heroes. You know who that put me on a John Coltrane, a Love uh, Supreme? Mm -hmm. Dr, oh, let's just say our brother, Dr. Cornell West. I saw he him got, speak at my university years ago. He, he was my professor. A lot. Yeah. What did you say? I said he references Coltrane a lot. Oh my God. He, uh, he I, I still haven't read her properly, but I wanna read Jane Austen and mm. John Coltrane, be, always because him. And yeah. that's the thing is he gets you excited to like read other books and to to listen to music. And and he doesn't do this thing where he he's an elitist, but he's not an elitist who forgets about the masses because he's yeah. not looking down on and shaming the music. Like it's a valid form of education. It's not necessarily the same yeah. level as the written form, but it's, right. you know, it's something like there's some learning going there's on. A, through yeah, it. there's a deep consciousness to his music. And he was, you know, there's, what is the, I forgot the name of the documentary. Somebody produced a documentary that was released a few years ago about John Coltrane. And it's pretty good. I mean, I, I liked it because I'm just a Coltrane head personally, yeah. but I think it's a really good introduction to him. And I would encourage you to check it out. I think it was on Netflix for, for a period of time. It might still I'll be, but I have it. But A Love Supreme is, it's a masterpiece. I mean, oh he, God. John Coltrane is a deeply spiritually connected human being. And it comes through, and if you follow his music, the evolution of his music, it's very clear that he and his wife, Alice, were both deeply in tune people. Even when he, he passes and she's putting out music on her own, I was just listening to her this morning. There's an album she has called Universal Consciousness. It's powerful. She's, she's incredible. You know, and, and, you know, I love Miles Davis because he yeah. was a no-nonsense kind of dude. I did not like the biopic, and I, 
I vent about it a lot because I didn't, I, you know, I love the brother who put it together. His name, his name is, um, what, I just forgot his name, Don Cheadle. Uh-huh. Don Cheadle did, I think like he made a producer, directed it, but he also started it. It's not something that I would lead people to, mm -hmm. but Miles Davis's autobiography is excellent because it sounds, he worked with Quincy Troop to write it, but it sounds like he's speaking to you. So you find yourself laughing every few pages because he's just like, he, he never gave a damn about a whole lot of crazy stuff. Like he was, he was himself. And his you interviews are really cool too. Like if you, you need just, that for that creativity that you were mentioning oh, and I was talking about earlier to be able to step out of the the programming that you've been given. You need yeah. a little bit of um, Malcolm Gladwell will call it disagreeableness. He thinks some of the yeah. people that have made some of the biggest changes for humanity they had a little bit of disagreeableness in them. Where <laughs> absolutely, you, I mean, you're not get where. How far are you getting if you don't have that in you? You're not. You don't have a clear perspective on something that that is counterculture. You know, I was talking with my professor, I, I referenced earlier yesterday, and I was telling him how like, when I first kind of stepped into this, this way of thinking and being, like I got hit over the head often. Mm -hmm. because I, was like, I just want to share this so that people would, you know, I was like, I want my people to say, wake up. And he was like, nah, you know how that is. Like whenever you're counterculture, like people, people will beat you down. And then you learn that you you move in a different way where you you live it you embody it and then if people show interest you know and they will they will ask you they will they will be able to sense it in a lot of us you know yeah. so he was the one who told me that kareem abdul jabbar used to have the largest physical jazz collection in the country like in the world wow. before his house burned down Jeez. He lost all kinds of jazz i mean he the kareem abdul jabbar is a real jazz head too you know, and you realize, man, like that's really black music that that people look over. Jazz used to be popular music until the Beatles came around. You know, so it's like you just got to I really I was like, I'm I want to know the history, like what's happening? Like, who are the artists? Who are the art, the jazz artists that we really don't know about? Who are the ones that got ripped off? You know, who are the ones that that's why Miles Davis is autobiography so good because he he tells it like it is from his I love autobiographies. I'm going to have to check that one out. I'm going to have to check really, that one out. Really, <laughs> it's really good. And I think about it right now, I kind of chuckle because he just, he didn't give a damn. Like he told the truth all the time, you know? And there's so much good music that black people have made that they don't really get credit for. You know, history has been rewritten. You know, I remember when I was a, a child, Michael Jackson would be referred to as the self-proclaimed king of pop. But they never did that to Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. They always called him the king of rock and roll when he wasn't, yeah. he was just the dude that was coming in and making black music. Yeah, he was biting it and he was doing it in a way that was palatable for their framework. Yeah, you know, and it's like he, he wasn't giving Chuck Berry credit or, no. you know, a little Richard or anybody else. So that made me even more interested because I was like, oh, okay. History's been rewritten, right? It's like the idea that the ancient, the, the ancient commissions were somehow Arab or even white. If you let these, you know, Hollywood movies from the fifties and sixties tell it, that's not true. And then that piques your interest and you go, well, what is the real story behind it? And I, I did that. Like, I still do that. It's how I kind of live, you know, and, and not just with, that type of history, but with the music too. With everything. You know, there's a lot of stuff, everything, man. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that, that we don't know that's hidden. And then you stumble upon it and you go, oh, okay, well, this is this is what KRS meant when he's referencing this artist. Or this is this is how Pete Rock flipped this sample. And then, okay, like I said before, who is Ahmad Jamal? And then you go down that rabbit hole and you're like, oh, this dude was one of the most accomplished pianists in the country and has an amazing discography of work that most people might not consider. So for me, it's just like, man, I, it's self-discovery at the end of the day. That's, that's beautiful, man. I, um, 
thank thank you so much, man, for your time today and breaking this all down. Anytime you want to come back for a book review, a movie review, because I do some sure. reviews on my own too. So oh, maybe if there's some, yeah, I'm if so you want to like come back for a book review or a movie review, I'm just trying to make this an avenue where we just have beauty in all these different forms. Or if you got any new projects, please come back anytime, brother. I will definitely no, and I and I thank you so much because I, I appreciate what who you are and, and what you represent and what you're building through this. It's so important that we bring voices together and engage and have discussions and share, you know, because we all have resources that we can learn from. And I, and I think it's critical to our own development and the development of our people, you know, in particular for us to do that. So thank you. I appreciate your time. All right. Thank you, brother. Yeah.